The negative impact of population growth is becoming appallingly evident. Heirs to an oil fortune join the divestment drive. In a highly symbolic gesture, the Rockefeller family will sell off its assets linked to fossil fuel companies. A slump in global oil prices has Saudi Arabia rethinking its near total dependence on oil revenue. We should be focusing on it and we should be curbing our you know, appetite for carbon intensive products and services. But the problem is it's got a lot of room for debate. Obviously, the Rockefellers are making this move as an environmental one, but also from an investment standpoint, this also makes plenty of business sense. You can't simply carry on business the way you're doing it now. There is a price to carbon in their future. What do you see as the biggest challenges in, in conservation? Yeah, the, the growing human population. At the dawn of the 20th century, a new international order was emerging, one founded on oil. And by the end of the 20th century, that order was firmly established. Heating, transportation, industrial power, plastic manufacturing, pharmaceuticals. There is no facet of modern life that is not, one way or another, dependent on oil. But the rulers of this oligarchy, the Rockefellers at Standard Oil, the British Royals at BP, the Dutch Royals and the Rothschilds at Royal Dutch Shell, were not content with mere financial domination. The power that came with their near-total monopoly on the world's most important commodity was enormous, and they had no qualms about using that power to remake the world in their image. As we saw in How Big Oil Conquered the World, the impact of the oligarchs has been breathtaking. From the education system to the medical profession, from the green revolution to the gene revolution, from World War to the Gulf War, oil money has been used to shape every aspect of the world we live in. With the rise of the petrodollar in the 1970s, even the international monetary system itself rests on oil. But now, in the 21st century, it seems that the old order, the oil order, is finally coming to an end. We begin looking at a new milestone in the growing campaign for divestment from the gas, oil, and coal companies that are fueling climate change. May Bouvi, executive director of 350.org, made the announcement just before our broadcast today. Today we're announcing that as of today, total divestment commitments have passed the $3.4 trillion mark. That's $3.4 trillion of assets under management now fossil free. In the oil and gas sector, we recognize the contribution of our activities and products to greenhouse gas emissions, which is why the OGCI was set up. What began as a movement on U.S. college campuses has reached the skyscrapers of high finance. Globally, nearly 200 institutions and thousands of individuals have moved a total of $50 billion in assets away from fossil fuels. If we take our money, put it into renewables like solar panels, the world could be such a better place. The masses, having identified the oligarchs and their destructive grip on the planet, see big oil waning and have begun to celebrate. To them, the promise of a post-carbon future represents the end of the oligarchy. What many do not realize, however, is that the oil order was never about oil. The oligarchs did not care about oil, but control. And, having long outgrown their financial dependence on the commodity that brought them their power and riches, they are at the forefront of this push for the post-carbon era. Now, the oligarchs are seeking to bring in a new international order, one in which their control is consolidated, their plan complete, their power unquestionable. One in which every aspect of human life, from energy to money to the very genome itself, is precisely ordered and technologically controlled. This is the story of what the oligarchs really desire and how they plan to achieve it.
1963. It's a day much like any other in Dhaka. The streets are crowded, dirty, squalid, smelly, and absolutely swarming with people. Lying in the streets, coiled in the gutters. Into that swarm of people steps a most unlikely figure. Wearing his drip-dry suit and hugging his briefcase, he sticks out from the crowd. Surveying the scene, he shakes his head ever so slightly before remarking, half to himself and half to his traveling companion, well, that's the problem, isn't it? It's a scene that has played itself out many times. A western tourist overwhelmed by the bustling crowds of the Indian subcontinent. But this was no mere tourist passing time on his holiday. This was John D. Rockefeller III, grandson of oil baron John D. Rockefeller. And, armed with the unimaginable wealth, power, and influence that his family name bestowed on him, he was on a mission to do something about the problem of overpopulation. Rockefeller approached that mission as a representative of the Population Council, a group that he himself had founded in 1952 to address the problem in Dhaka and elsewhere. On its surface, the Population Council was a straightforward organization with a straightforward task, to support medical and scientific research into the question of the growing human population. But the dark history of the Council and its guiding philosophy reveal Rockefeller's true interest in this problem and its ultimate solution. John D. Rockefeller III, or JDR III, as he was known to the constellation of researchers, businessmen, politicians, diplomats, and royals in the orbit of the Rockefeller family, had decided early on how to make proper use of the formidable money and power at his disposal by controlling the population of the planet. In 1934, the then 28-year-old JDR III had written a letter to his father, John D. Rockefeller Jr., about the Rockefeller Foundation's research into birth control and related questions, declaring, I have come pretty definitely to the conclusion that it is the field in which I will be interested, for the present at least, to concentrate my own giving. JDR III was nothing if not a man of his word. After commissioning a Rockefeller Foundation fact-finding mission to Asia to report on the threat of the growing third world population, he organized a conference of the top medical and demographic researchers of the era to discuss, as the very title of the meeting termed it, population problems. From that meeting emerged the idea for an organization, the Population Council, to guide the development of the burgeoning field of population and fertility research. JDR3 personally donated $1.35 million of his own money to found the council and provide its initial operating expenses. Like his father and grandfather before him, Rockefeller had learned to use philanthropy and largesse as a mask for his true intention, control. But that mask slipped when he penned a draft of the council's charter revealing the organization's true purpose. The council, according to JDR3, would promote research and apply existing knowledge to help develop such changes in the attitudes, habits, and environmental pressures affecting the life of human beings, so that within every social and economic grouping, parents who were above the average in intelligence, quality of personality, and affection will tend to have larger-than-average families. Thomas Perrin, the former Surgeon General of the United States and Council co-founder, warned against including such a blunted mission in the Council's mission statement. Such questions arise as the following, he warned. Who is to determine the parents who are above average in affection? Also, who would decide the persons having better than average personality? Frankly, the implications of this, while I know they were intended to have a eugenic implication, could readily be misunderstood as a Nazi master race philosophy. I have, therefore, recast this paragraph. The line was dropped from the final version of the charter. In truth, however, that sentence had not been written by JDR3 himself. Instead, it had been copied word for word from the back cover of Eugenical News, the central publication of the American eugenics movement. This was no mere accident. Frederick Osborne, one of the co-founders of the council and its first president after Rockefeller stepped down in 1957, was also the president of the American Eugenics Society. When the Population Council was founded, both Osborne and the American Eugenics Society he directed formally moved their operations into the Council's New York office, 
with the Eugenics Society now taking its funding directly from Rockefeller's Population Council grant. The Population Council was the Eugenics Society, under another name. Eugenics. This was the guiding vision of JDR3 and the Rockefeller family's philanthropy. A vision that cast the Rockefellers and their fellow oligarchs as superior families, fit by very virtue of their wealth and success to guide the course of world events. The power to determine who was fit to breed and who was too poor to pass on their genes. Eugenics is basically a movement among the elite to eradicate what they deem the inferior classes. And that's the inferior social classes, racial classes, ethnic classes, more or less everyone who isn't up to their standards. And after eradicating those classes, what they aim to do is genetically engineer themselves to such a high level that the remaining population that they permit to exist beneath them will never have the power to overthrow them, essentially, the end of history. So the term itself was coined by Galton, and it essentially means well-born. Uh, the idea is kind of a mix of a bunch of ideas that were circulating around the 1850s. So if you go uh, back to, say, Mendel, Mendel was studying uh, hereditary characteristics in pea plants, and he was able to determine that certain characteristics were being passed on and that these things could be uh, determined and, and essentially predicted. And also at the same time, now you have Spencer, who's talking about the survival of the fittest with the same kind of idea, the same thread running through there, that there are genetic characteristics that exist that would make um, one species, one plant or animal more fit than another and more capable of surviving. Also, of course, you had Darwin. Darwin's work at the time, Origin of Species, and kind of maps this process by which uh, material is is passed along, and uh, you know evolution results through this process. So, so Galton is essentially taking all of these ideas, and uh, he he was kind of known for uh, observing and identifying patterns, and what he essentially did was started to come up with this concept, this idea that through studying human characteristics, they could, if they chose to, uh, breed superior human beings. Obsessed with breeding and family heredity, the eugenicists believed that it was not merely physical characteristics like weight or height that were determined by one's family line, but social characteristics like intelligence, or conscientiousness, or even criminality. If you were poor, it's because you come from poor stock. If you're criminal, it's because your family line is criminal. And if you're a Rockefeller, or a Rothschild, or a royal, you are rich and successful because your family was destined for fortune and success. The pseudoscientific trappings of this 19th century eugenic philosophy may have been new, but in fact, the idea is as old as human civilization itself. People have always been taught to believe that their rulers are special, a class apart, members of a family specially chosen to rule over the masses. Whether literal descendants of the gods, like the pharaohs of Egypt or the emperors of Japan, or members of families specially chosen by God to reign over their kingdoms, like the monarchs of Europe, the right to rule over others was something passed down through family trees. The commoners, meanwhile, knew their place. Not being born of royal blood, they entered the world as serfs, worked the land for the benefit of the noble class, and, if they were lucky, had children of their own to repeat the cycle for another generation. But the breakdown of medieval feudalism gave rise to a newly wealthy merchant class. The development of the scientific method challenged centuries of religious dogma. The spread of Enlightenment philosophy led to the toppling of monarchs and the rise of democracy. 
and the Industrial Revolution paved the way for the rise of the robber barons and the creation of vast new family fortunes. By the late 19th century, as the oligarchs in America and Europe began to consolidate their wealth, a new justification for elite rule of society was needed. One that discarded with outdated appeals to supernatural order and seemed to rest on a bedrock of science. An idea that could explain how nouveau riche upstarts like the Rockefellers and Rothschilds had risen to positions of prominence in society alongside the old royal dynasties of Europe. Eugenics fit the bill perfectly. The answer was in their genes. Well, I think this eugenic idea that, that comes about of survival of the fittest uh, almost gives a scientific excuse for some of the most inhumane and horrific actions that have ever been journeyed by humanity and then manifested. So the idea of controlling people through cr controlling reproduction and reproductive capability and access to, to mates and stuff like this is an idea that's thousands of years old. So eugenics, when it came around, you know, in a, in a strong form in the late 1800s, where you've got people like the Darwins, the, the Wedgwoods and the Huxleys, specifically T.H. Huxley, Thomas H. Huxley was known as Darwin's bulldog. So these ideas of eugenics uh, really take on, you know, a new life of their own at the end of the 1800s and coming into the 1900s. These ideas were embraced by the same families that were these robber barons that were being funded by the Rothschild banking network. Also, the, the Fabian Socialist Society, which, again, had a lot of the same movers and shakers as these people who were higher ups in, in, the, in the British Empire. So when it reared its head in the 1920s and 30s and these forced sterilization campaigns, whereas, you know, if they felt that you had a low IQ or that you had some congenital disease that would be passed on, that you didn't have the right to, to marry and have, and have children. Eugenics, of course, was pseudoscience. When Galton and his fellow travelers began developing the theory, the identification of the actual mechanism of heredity, including genes and DNA, was nearly 100 years away. Instead, they used catch-all terms with no definition like feeble-mindedness to diagnose poverty or criminality, claiming it was caused by defective germplasm. They used phrenology to try to determine the physical expression of alcoholism or low intelligence. Even the most famous works of the eugenics era, like Henry Goddard's study of the Kallikak family, were roundly discredited and even repudiated by their authors. It's 100% pseudoscientific. It's, it's, the, it's absolutely arbitrary. The, the characteristics that they're looking for, something like feeble-mindedness, is something that is not only not scientific, it can essentially be uh, described in any way that the person who is observing wants it to be described. So feeble-minded could mean that maybe you stutter, so then you're feeble-minded. Maybe you're shy, so you're feeble-minded. Maybe uh, they just don't like the way you act, <laughs> so you're feeble-minded. But the idea was an infectious one. Like all the most enticing pseudoscience, it explained so much with so little effort. It appealed to the vanity of the researchers, usually hailing from successful and wealthy families themselves, and it gave an excuse for social engineering on a scale never before dreamed of. When eugenics crossed the Atlantic, spreading from the rarefied British countryside of Galton and his cohorts to the rocky shores of America, it hit ambitious young researchers like Charles Davenport with hurricane force. A Harvard-trained zoologist who had grown up in a strict, puritanical family of New England Congregationalists, Davenport's authoritarian father was obsessed with genealogy, tracing the family tree all the way back to his Anglo-Saxon forebears in 1086. When the younger Davenport discovered Galton's writing while working in a biological laboratory on Long Island, he found his purpose in life. As he later told the American Breeders Association, which became an important ally in his eugenicist cause. Society must protect itself. As it claims the right to deprive the murderer of his life, so also it may annihilate the hideous serpent of hopelessly vicious protoplasm. With the proselytizing fervor of a religious convert, Davenport concocted an ambitious idea for furthering the eugenic cause. The creation of a eugenics record office to register the genetic background of every single man, woman, and child in America, 
and eventually the world, so that every person could be categorized by their family line and assigned a genetic rating. Once completed, those with the lowest eugenic value could be eliminated from the gene pool. So the idea of eugenics makes its way to America, lands in the lap of Charles Davenport, who approaches the Carnegie Institute for funding. And on the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, they set up this uh, essentially an institute to study eugenics. And this eventually evolves with some Harriman money into the eugenics records office. So between this initial uh, institute that's set up at Cold Spring Harbor and then the eugenics record office, which is also added to that, uh, you're, you're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars of funding that's put forward to go out and investigate and find the inferior germ plasm, basically. That's, that's how it's often described. The Rockefeller Foundation's initial contribution to the Eugenics Record Office, a mere $21,650, was a small sum, but it came with clear benefits. Not only the institutional infrastructure and the personnel of the Foundation and the prestige of the Rockefeller name itself, but the promise of increased support as the work advanced. And as always, the Rockefellers were true to their word. Rockefeller Foundation researchers like William Welch, the founding director of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, sat on the ERO's board and helped direct its activities. The Rockefellers also provided funds for specific research, like a $10,000 grant to survey New York's Nassau County for the eugenically unfit. And it created sister organizations like the Bureau of Social Hygiene, which cross-pollinated research and researchers with Davenport's own laboratory. John D. Rockefeller Jr. especially showed an interest in Davenport's work right from the start. They kept up a regular correspondence on a number of eugenics issues. In January 1912, when a plan to institutionalize mentally deficient female convicts to stop them from having children was floated, the young Rockefeller heir wrote to Davenport for his thoughts on the scheme. For his part, Jr. declared that, This plan seems to me an immensely important one. It points out a scientific way of escape from the evils which our courts are intended to correct, but in reality only increase. After Davenport responded that the plan would only work if it included a eugenical screening of the convicts, Jr. contributed $200,000 to found just such an institute. The Institute of Criminology in New York was administered by Rockefeller's own Bureau of Social Hygiene and staffed by workers trained at the Eugenics Record Office. Fueled by the support of America's rich and powerful, the field of eugenics transformed from the quaint hobby horse of a few mad scientists into the social cause of an entire generation. Economists, politicians, authors, activists. By the 1920s, everyone who was anyone was extolling the need to eradicate the germplasm of the lower stock. Marie Stopes, the celebrated family planning pioneer who founded Britain's first birth control clinic in North London in 1921, railed against hordes of defectives, calling for the compulsory sterilization of those she deemed unfit for parenthood. Tommy Douglas, now venerated as a hero in Canada for his role in founding the nation's healthcare system, submitted a master's thesis to McMaster University advocating that subnormals defectives, and morons like those with low IQ or physical abnormalities be isolated on a state farm or in a colony where decisions could be made for them by a competent supervisor and called on the government to certify mental and physical fitness to stop the unfit from breeding. John Maynard Keynes, the economist who gave us the Keynesian economic school that is still popular among central planners today, was himself president of the British Eugenics Society from 1937 to 1944. Alexander Graham Bell is still revered as the inventor of the telephone, but was in fact an early supporter of Charles Davenport and a founding member of the Eugenic Records Office Board of Scientific Directors. He openly campaigned for the eradication of the deaf race by governments intervening to stop deaf people from marrying. Nobel Prize-winning playwright and author George Bernard Shaw advocated for the creation of a government panel that would require everyone to justify their existence before it, 
if they failed to do so, Shaw thought those people should be killed by the state. Eventually, with foundation funding and promotion, this eugenicist mindset filtered down into the popular culture. The American Eugenics Society sponsored fitter family contests at state fairs, awarding prizes to families scoring the highest on eugenic health tests. The society also sponsored contests to award prizes to clergy who fit the message of eugenics into their sermons. Eugenics even found its way to the silver screen. Well, we thought it necessary to present your family's case to the State Medical Commission. And after an examination, they decided there was but one important action to take. To have your entire family sterilized. Well, what's that? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, we investigated your family's history, Alice. And those of the past three generations have been feeble-minded. Congenital cripples or habitual drunkards. Instead of improving, each generation is more of a problem. Now, in this state, we have a law which provides for such people to have an operation so there won't be any more children. I see. But merely popularizing their ideas was not the goal of the eugenicists. They wanted action. And in this case, that meant concrete steps towards eliminating the defective germplasm from the human population. Government-sanctioned murder of those deemed unfit was always one option on the table. And it wasn't just playwrights like Bernard Shaw advocating for government death panels. Eugenicists of all stripes discussed and debated the idea of murdering degenerates as the quickest way of achieving their goals. Mistaken regard for what are believed to be divine laws and a sentimental belief in the sanctity of human life tend to prevent both the elimination of defective infants and the sterilization of such adults as are themselves of no value to the community. The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit, and human life is valuable only when it is of use to the community or race. Madison Grant, director of the American Eugenics Society, 1915. But mainstream eugenicists realized that this approach was not possible in the political and judicial climate of the day. As Henry Goddard noted in his infamous study on the Kallikak family, for the low-grade idiot, the loathsome unfortunate that may be seen in our institutions, some have proposed the lethal chamber, but humanity is steadily tending away from the possibility of that method, and there is no probability that it will ever be practiced. Instead, they would have to turn to the other option, the more politically acceptable solution for stopping the undesirables from breeding. Forced sterilization. Indiana passed America's first eugenic sterilization law in 1907, and with only a few years, there were a dozen states where those deemed unfit were being legally sterilized against their will. But still, this was not enough for the eugenicists. The approach was too scattershot. Only a few thousand sterilizations had taken place under these laws, and Indiana's own Forced Sterilization Act was overturned by the state Supreme Court in 1921. Once again, Harry Laughlin, Davenport's right-hand man at the Rockefeller-funded Eugenics Record Office, stepped in to solve the problem. He drafted a model eugenic sterilization law in 1922 that became the basis for Virginia's 1924 Sterilization Act. To confront the issues head-on, the eugenicists decided to challenge the law's constitutionality themselves and take the lawsuit all the way to the Supreme Court. All they needed was the right test case to bring to trial. And they found that case in Carrie Buck, an 18-year-old ward of the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and the Feeble-Minded, who was neither epileptic nor feeble-minded. But start back in the 1920s with Carrie Buck. So she's a young woman who is uh, growing up in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, being raised by a single mother. Back then, there was a belief that it was better often to take poor children away from their parents and put them in middle class homes. So she was put in a foster family that treated her very badly. She wasn't allowed to call the parents mother and father. She did a lot of housekeeping for them and was rented out to the neighbors. And then one summer, she was raped by the nephew of her foster mother. She becomes pregnant out of wedlock. And rather than help her with this pregnancy, they decide to get her declared epileptic and feeble-minded, though she was neither, and she shipped off to the Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded outside of Lynchburg, Virginia. 
And what happened to her there? So she gets there just the wrong time. Virginia has just passed uh, a, a, a eugenic sterilization law, and they want to test it in the courts. So they seize on Carrie Buck as the perfect plaintiff in this lawsuit. So they decide to make her the first person in Virginia who will be eugenically sterilized. And suddenly she's in the middle of a case that's headed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The case was a sham, concocted merely to get the Supreme Court stamp of approval on the issue of forced sterilization. Buck's independent counsel was in fact Irving Whitehead, one of the founding directors of the colony that was pushing to sterilize her, and the man who appointed the director that was pushing for her sterilization. Buck herself was not feeble-minded, nor was her mother, nor was her daughter, Vivian Buck, who Carrie bore as a result of being raped and who was declared feeble-minded as a baby because, as a social worker testified during the trial, there was a look about it that is not quite normal. But just what it is, I can't tell. None of these facts matter to the Supreme Court. Presided over by former President and Chief Justice William Howard Taft, the court voted 8-1 to one in favor of upholding Buck's forced sterilization and the constitutionality of the Virginia eugenic sterilization law itself. Writing the decision was one of the most famous and venerated justices in the history of the court, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., himself a eugenicist from the so-called Boston Brahmin sect of the hereditary East Coast establishment. In his decision, Holmes justified the forced sterilization of those like Buck by calling on the government's right to vaccinate the citizens against their will. It is better for all the world if, instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes, he declared before infamously concluding, three generations of imbeciles are enough. And with that, the floodgates were opened. New laws were enacted and old laws revised to comport with the Supreme Court's decision. Forcible sterilizations, taking place in a covert and low-key manner before, were now reported with pride. A few thousand individuals sterilized against their will became tens of thousands. The eugenics era, brought into being by the immense fortune of the Rockefellers and their ilk, had arrived. And with the aid of a very dramatic push by the Rockefellers, it was about to go international. Beginning in November 1922, and increasing throughout the 1920s, the Rockefeller Foundation began a series of grants and fellowships to German scientists. Equivalent to millions of dollars in today's money, these fellowships transformed the German scientific establishment, devastated in the wake of World War I. The Foundation's money found its way into the coffers of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes, a series of scientific organizations that included an institute for psychiatry and an institute for anthropology, human heredity, and eugenics. One of the main beneficiaries of this Rockefeller largesse was Ernst Rudin, a head researcher at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Psychiatry and a key architect of Germany's eugenics program under the Third Reich. Rudin co-edited the official rules and commentary on the law for the prevention of defective progeny, which was passed on July 14, 1933, less than six months after Hitler was appointed interim chancellor by President Paul von Hindenburg. The law, like the Virginia law that the Supreme Court upheld and led to the sterilization of Carrie Buck and tens of thousands of other Americans, was modeled on Harry Laughlin's model eugenic sterilization legislation. It formed genetic health courts which could mandate sterilization of defectives in eight different categories. The feeble-minded, schizophrenics, manic depressives, sufferers of Huntington's chorea, epileptics, those with hereditary deformities, the blind, and the deaf. Alcoholics, a ninth category, were to be optionally added to the list with a caution against inclusion of ordinary drunkards. By the end of the year, 62,400 Germans were found unfit to breed and sterilized against their will. By 1945, that number had reached 400,000. In the 1940s, that eugenics program was to expand into euthanasia under the Action T4 program, resulting in over 70,000 children, senior citizens, and psychiatric patients being murdered by the Nazi regime. As the dust settled on World War II, the name of eugenics became synonymous with the Nazis in the minds of the general public. The eugenicists, outraged, 
knew that their work could not continue any longer under the name of eugenics. But that didn't mean that it couldn't continue. So after World War II, you don't hear about it anymore as eugenics. What you hear is molecular biology and these sorts of colloquial terms that were developed by the Rockefeller Foundation, which was one of the families primarily in America that was helping to fund it in America, in Britain, in Germany, who also funded Hitler during that time. So there's a lot of overlaps between the people who were actually out there funding genocide and the people who had ideas about culling the population and population control and sterilizing people. And these ideas go on and permeate society to this day. As American Eugenic Society co-founder Frederick Osborne wrote, eugenic goals are most likely to be attained under a name other than eugenics. Thus, he moved the American Eugenic Society into the offices of John D. Rockefeller III's Population Council, becoming president in 1957. The Rockefellers and their fellow oligarchs had for generations felt themselves to be stewards of the planet, protecting it from the rising tide of the genetically inferior. They were not about to give up that quest. They would simply have to package it under a different name. With all the evidence that we've amassed in our preparations for the Stockholm Conference, including the views of many of the world's leading scientists, uh, I am convinced that the prophets of doom have got to be taken seriously. In other words, doomsday is a possibility. I'm equally convinced that doomsday is not inevitable. On paper, it would be almost impossible to find a less likely candidate for godfather of the modern environmental movement than Maurice Strong. A junior high school dropout from a poor family in rural Manitoba struck hard by the Great Depression, Strong's meteoric rise to the heights of wealth and political influence is itself remarkable. The sheer number of environmental organizations that he founded, conferences he chaired, campaigns he directed, and accolades he received over the course of his career is even more remarkable. Organizer of the Stockholm Environmental Conference, founding director of the United Nations Environment Programme, Secretary General of the Rio Earth Summit, founder of the Earth Council and the Earth Charter Movement, chair of the World Resources Institute, commissioner of the World Commission on Environment and Development, and board member of a bewildering array of organizations, from the International Institute for Sustainable Development, to the Stockholm Environment Institute, to the African American Institute. But perhaps the most remarkable thing about Strong, this ubiquitous figure of the 20th century environmental movement, was his background. A Rockefeller-connected millionaire from the Alberta oil patch who divided his time between environmental campaigning and running major oil companies. To understand how this came about, we have to examine the history of the emergence of the environmental movement. In the post-war period, the desire to control the population put on a new mask, protecting the world from resource depletion, pollution, and ecological catastrophe. And, as always, the Rockefeller family was there to provide the funding and organizational support to steer this burgeoning movement toward their own ends. President Nixon and the United States Congress established the Commission on Population Growth and the American Future. The chairman of this unique commission is John D. Rockefeller III. It was a very broad-ranging mandate. Nobody's had one uh, of this character before. And just from that, this question of quality of life just emerged as the seemingly key issue. But the main finding was that stabilization of some kind is, is clearly uh, desirable for the country. Yes, we, we said that it is recognized that population cannot continue to grow indefinitely. Nobody questions that. And we said from our findings, we felt that now the nation should welcome and plan for a stabilized population. But the whole question of pollution, environment, and population came very much to the fore in amazingly rapid time. And President Nixon, in July 1969, made a statement to the Congress exclusively on this question. 
And I'd like to read just two sentences from that statement, as I think it's indicative of his concern in regard to the subject and his recognition of its importance uh, here and around the world. He said, one of the most serious challenges to human destiny in the last third of this century will be the growth of the population. Whether man's response to this challenge will be a cause for pride or for despair in the year 2000 will depend very much on what we do today. Joining the Rockefellers in shaping the international environmental movement were their fellow oligarchs across the Atlantic, including the British royals behind BP and the Dutch royals behind Royal Dutch Shell, and facilitating the transition from eugenics to population control to environmentalism was Julian Huxley, brother of Brave New World author Aldous Huxley and grandson of Darwin's bulldog T.H. Huxley. Julian Huxley was a committed eugenicist, chairing the British Eugenic Society from 1959 to 1962. But, like the other eugenicists of the post-war era, he understood the need to pursue the now discredited work of eugenics under a different guise. The founding director of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, Huxley wrote in the agency's founding document about the need to find ways to make the cause of eugenics politically viable once again. At the moment, it is probable that the indirect effect of civilization is dysgenic instead of eugenic. And in any case, it seems likely that the dead weight of genetic stupidity, physical weakness, mental instability, and disease proneness, which already exist in the human species, will prove too great a burden for real progress to be achieved. Thus, even though it is quite true that any radical eugenic policy will be for many years politically and psychologically impossible, it will be important for UNESCO to see that the eugenic problem is examined with the greatest care, and that the public mind is informed of the issues at stake, so that much that now is unthinkable may at least become thinkable. Huxley found the perfect front for the reintroduction of these unthinkable eugenical ideas in 1948, when he used UNESCO as a springboard for founding the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and then again in 1961, when he used that agency as a springboard to create the World Wildlife Fund. Joining Huxley as co-founders of the fund were not only Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, founder of the Bilderberg Group and former employee of the IG Farben conglomerate, and Prince Philip of England, but Godfrey A. Rockefeller of the Rockefeller dynasty. Together, they pledged to harness public opinion and educate the world about the necessity for conservation. Years of education about the strain that the growing human population put on the resources of the earth, paid for by the very oligarchs who had just spent the past century monopolizing one of the world's key resources, led, inevitably, to a predictable conclusion. Now, for the first time in the history of man, an international movement is underway. The people of the nations and the nations of the world have joined together to find the answers. This building and the world's representatives hold the solution. We have seen what we've done to bring about the destruction of our Earth. Is it not the time now to cure the disease that we ourselves have created? Yes, the cure for the disease of mankind according to Rockefeller-funded propaganda featuring John D. Rockefeller III as an expert commentator, was to be found at the United Nations, whose headquarters had been so graciously donated by the Rockefeller family itself. And the first step toward discovering that cure was to organize the UN Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm in 1972, the world's first international environmental conference. For 11 days in June 1972, Stockholm was a magnet for everyone concerned with the environment. 1,200 official delegates from 113 nations were in Stockholm for the first international conference on the human environment. The meeting, first proposed to the United Nations by Sweden and approved by the General Assembly in 1968, attracted worldwide attention. In four short years, the topic of the human environment had gone from the back pages of newspapers to make headlines on page one. And who better to oversee the conference and lay the institutional groundwork for this burgeoning, oligarch-supported movement 
than a consummate oil man. The very fact that the conference began with 113 participating countries with very high level uh, delegations from those countries, this in itself represented a very significant step forward because this demonstrated more than any, any, anything else the real concern of the majority of countries in the world. All his life, Maurice Strong had the uncanny ability to be in the right place at the right time to meet the right person to advance up the ranks. Having been born in Oak Lake, Manitoba in 1929, and suffering through the Great Depression, the ambitious young Strong dropped out of school at age 14 and headed north to look for work. Finding his way to Chesterfield Inlet, Strong got a job as a fur buyer for the Hudson's Bay Company, and there met Wild Bill Richardson, a prospector whose wife, Mary McCall, hailed from the family behind McCall Frontenac, one of Canada's largest oil companies. So Mr. Strong sort of enters the big world through a guy by the name of Wild Bill Richardson, who was a sort of prospector um, married into an oil family called McCall, uh, whose company was called McCall Frontenac. It was a, a major importer of oil from the Middle East. Had been taken over long since by the technical company through a brokerage house called Nesbitt Thompson. So in a way, Mr. Strong was introduced to the world of big oil um, and the world of resources at a very young age, was picked up as a very smart kid, taken under the wing of a man named Paul Martin Sr., who was a cabinet minister um, and whose son would go on to become the prime minister of Canada. Um, and introduced to the oil patch through people at the very top, and that would include David Rockefeller. Through the Richardsons, Strong made a series of increasingly unlikely connections. First, he was introduced to the treasurer of the then brand new United Nations, Noah Minaud. Unbelievably, Minaud didn't just secure Strong a job as a junior security officer at UN headquarters, he allowed the young Manitoba farm boy to live with him in New York. And while there, Minaud introduced Strong to the most important contact of his life, David Rockefeller. From that moment on, Strong was a made man. And from that moment on, wherever Strong went, Rockefeller and his associates were there somewhere in the background. It was a Standard Oil veteran, Jack Gallagher, who gave Strong his big break in the Alberta oil patch when he quit his UN security job to return to Canada. And when Maurice Strong suddenly decided to quit that oil patch job, sell his house, and travel to Africa, he supported himself working for Rockefeller's Caltex in Nairobi. When he quit that job in 1954 and started his own company back in Canada, he hired Henry Bruni, a close friend of Rockefeller associate John J. McCloy, to manage it, and appointed two Standard Oil of New Jersey reps to its board. By his late 20s, he was running his own company, and was already a millionaire. As he would throughout his life, Maurice Strong capitalized on these connections and opportunities to full effect. After being chosen to organize the UN Environmental Conference in Stockholm, he was appointed a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation, which then funded his office for the Stockholm Summit and supplied Carnegie Fellow Barbara Ward and Rockefeller ecologist René Dubose for his team. Strong commissioned them to write Only One Earth, a foundational text in the sustainable development arena that is heavily touted by globalists as a key document for promoting the global management of resources. The 1972 Stockholm Summit is still hailed as a landmark moment in the history of the modern environmental movement, leading not only to the first governmentally administered environmental action plans in Europe, but the creation of an entirely new UN bureaucracy, the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP. Naturally, the UN appointed Maurice Strong as UNEP's first director. Shortly thereafter, Strong continued his double life by jumping straight back into the oil patch. Eastern Canada was hit particularly hard by the OPEC oil embargo, and as a result, then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau created Petro Canada, Canada's national oil company. And who did he tap as the company's first president? None other than that crusading Rockefeller-backed environmentalist, Maurice Strong. Leaving that post in 1978, Strong continued with a scarcely believable series of governmental, private sector, and international appointments, 
from chairman of the Canada Development Investment Corporation to chairman of AZL Resources Incorporated to leading the UN's famine relief program in Africa. In 1987, Strong helped to organize another environmental conference, much less known but no less remarkable than the Stockholm Summit. Dubbed the Fourth World Wilderness Congress, the meeting took place in Denver, Colorado, and brought together Strong, David Rockefeller, Edmund de Rothschild, then-Treasury Secretary James Baker, and a gaggle of other oligarchs, bankers, Washington power players, and globalists, ostensibly to talk about the environment. What they actually discussed was altogether more incredible. I suggest, therefore, that this be sold not through a democratic process. That would take too long and devour far too much of the funds to educate the cannon fodder, unfortunately, which populates the earth. We have to take almost an elitist program that we can see beyond our swollen bellies and look to the future in time frames and in results which are not easily understood or which can be, with intellectual honesty, be reduced down to some kind of simplistic definition. Those were the words of David Lang, a banker from Montreal who spoke during the conference. And to Lang, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, and the other bankers and oligarchs assembled at the meeting, the general population are cannon fodder that unfortunately populates the earth. This candid admission, a perfect encapsulation of the eugenical ideas at the heart of the global conservation movement funded into existence by the oligarchs themselves, was caught on tape by George Hunt, a businessman in Boulder, Colorado, who had volunteered to help the conference as a concerned citizen and came away horrified by what he had witnessed there. He released his own recordings of the proceedings in the early 1990s to warn the public about this group and its ultimate aims. Hunt's recording captured the moment when Maurice Strong introduced Baron Edmund de Rothschild, whose father's cousin had sold the Rothschild's Azerbaijani oil fields to Royal Dutch Shell in 1911, as a pioneer of the environmental movement and a founder of the concept of conservation banking. One of the most important initiatives that is uh, open here for your consideration is of that of the uh, uh, conservation banking program. Uh, as we mentioned this morning, we have as our chairman, fortunately, the person who really is the source of this very uh, significant uh, concept. Uh, he uh, he uh, uh, was, is one of the trustees of the International Wilderness Foundation, which sponsored this meeting. He, has, he was at the first of these congresses. So his conversion to the relationship between conservation and economic development uh, has been a, a, a pioneering one. So there is no better person. He epitomizes in his own life that positive synthesis between environment, conservation on the one hand, and economics on the other. And I'm just delighted to have this opportunity of uh, introducing to you Edmund de Rothschild. Maurice, thank you very much indeed for all that you've said uh, and uh, I would ask the audience to take with a slight grain of salt all that he has said about me. The meeting accomplished some important goals for the oligarchs. It led to the creation of wilderness areas, vast expanses of natural terrain from which the public could be largely excluded. These areas were to be designated and overseen by the IUCN, the same body that British Eugenic Society President Julian Huxley used as a springboard to creating the World Wildlife Fund. Another important goal of the conference was Rothschild's proposal for the creation of a so-called World Conservation Bank that would operate at a supranational level and coordinate finance for development projects around the world. The meetings now of the new concept of an international conservation banking program involves all sectors of the human community. Governmental and intergovernmental agencies, the public and private agencies, large charitable foundations, as well as ordinary individuals worldwide. By thinking forward as to how to reach out to the public at large, to every corporate entity throughout the world, to put aside 
hopefully tax-free, a part of their profits to fund our ecological and environmental protection. Ladies and gentlemen, every country has its own problems, its indigenous peoples and its wildlife. This International Conservation Bank must know no frontiers, no boundaries. This World Conservation Bank was forwarded and eventually realized at Maurice Strong's next major conference, the one which was to serve as the crowning achievement of his unlikely career as environmental crusader, and which still remains one of the touchstones of the environmental movement, the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. In June 1992, the world met in Rio to discuss the fate of planet Earth. In this largest summit and very first Earth summit ever held, representatives from 166 countries, 130 heads of state, and 15,000 non-governmental organizations came together with the hopes of deciding specific agreements that would balance environmental preservation with economic needs. And my gratitude to Secretary General Maurice Strong for his tireless work in bringing this Earth Summit together. This is truly an historic gathering. There are those who say that economic growth and environmental protection cannot be compatible. The world is our garden, and together we must cultivate it. This week at Rio, we have made a start. Beyond Rio, we must continue to carry it through. We cannot be complacent unless the agreements reached here are accompanied by real commitments to significant change. Change, of course, indeed, for the human species. In my view, Your Excellencies, we, are, we simply are headed for a, a, a moment in the 21st century where the condition of our species may become uh, terminal. As useful as the Fourth World Wilderness Congress had been in advancing the agenda of Maury Strong and the oligarchs, that was only setting the stage for the Earth Summit in Rio. At the Earth Summit, Edmund de Rothschild got his World Conservation Bank. Dubbed the Global Environment Facility and launched at the summit itself, it serves as the funding mechanism for five different UN conventions and provides billions of dollars worth of financing to environmental and development projects around the world. Its 18 implementing partners include the Rockefeller-funded Food and Agricultural Organization, the Huxley-founded International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the Maury Strong-created United Nations Environment Program, and the Prince Bernard, Prince Philip, Godfrey Rockefeller-founded World Wildlife Fund. One of the Global Environment Facility's specialties are debt-for-nature swaps, where third-world countries are given debt relief in return for opening their land up for environmental development projects. The projects come with transaction costs of up to 5%, paid to the contractors who manage and direct the investments, not the locals, who, like the aborigines of Palawan Island, are kicked off their land and effectively wiped off the face of the map. The Earth Summit also gave rise to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the body to which the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change delivers its reports. Generally thought to be neutral, non-governmental bodies relying only on science and evidence, the UNFCCC and the IPCC are handcuffed by the terms that Strong set out for them to deliver only one conclusion. That humanity is to blame for climate change. When they set up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Morris Strong, who we, we should talk a lot about, um, he wrote the terms of reference. And uh, the first term of reference was the definition of climate change. And he limited it deliberately to only human causes of climate change. And, uh, of course, that effectively eliminated all the natural causes, natural variability, which is why you see them not looking at things like the sun, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other, other issues. And, um, of course, he then limited it even further in uh, another term of reference that you, he, he set it up into three working groups. There was the technical group, working group one, which was, wrote the science report. 
And that was 600 of the 2,500 people. The other 1,900 were in working groups two and three. Now, they were inconsequential because they had to accept the findings of working group one, which were already limited by their terms of reference. So whatever their finding was, working group two and three then said, okay, you're you telling us it's going to warm. We accept that as fact. We now look at the implications of that. And that's where you hear all these stories about, oh, the, melt, the, the ice is going to melt, the sea level is going to melt. So really... The majority of the report by 1900 scientists is accepting without question the finding of the first group. Now, strong, it really restricted it even more because they then, well, they, they came out and said, look, the, this report is not to be used for policy. But then they set up the summary for policymakers, the absolute contradiction of that. And the summary for policymakers is written by a, a, a completely separate group. And then they write it independent of the science report. They write science reports finished and set aside. The summary for policymakers is written and, and given out to the media. But the rules, the terms of reference that Strong wrote said that the summary for policymakers goes back to the science report people and says, make sure your science report agrees with what we've put in the summary. Another product of the Earth Summit in Rio was the Earth Charter, a quasi-religious document that Mikhail Gorbachev, who helped draft the text along with Maurice Strong, referred to as a replacement for the Ten Commandments, and which sought to usher in an era of Gaia worship and global responsibility, declaring that fundamental changes are needed in our values, institutions, and ways of living, the document then counsels that we must create a world of shared responsibility to the Earth community before concluding, In order to build a sustainable global community, the nations of the world must renew their commitment to the United Nations, fulfill their obligations under existing international agreements, and support the implementation of Earth Charter principles with an international, legally binding instrument on environment and development. Well, the Earth Charter was one of the byproducts, ultimately, of the first Earth Summit. I published the Earth Charter in, my, in the appendix of my book, uh, Technocracy Rising, the Trojan Horse of Global Transformation, just so people could see this with their own eyes, what it says. It was, um, it was a document that was like a, a, a compact with the world. Uh, it was a very religious, humanistic document that um, that tried to unify the world into a single concept of globalization. And it was a very defined document that was signed off. Uh, the history goes back before that, but it was finally signed off uh, by I don't know how many, just almost all the nations at the United Nations. And the primary author of the Earth Charter was Stephen Rockefeller. And so the Rockefellers understood early on that, no, it's not just the economic system and it's not just necessarily the political control system. We also have to factor in a religious belief that we can use to get people to believe what we're doing is for their good. What the oligarchs had been working toward for decades, and what they achieved in Rio in 1992, was the completion of the transformation of the eugenics philosophy, from talk of sterilization of the feeble-minded, to a popular understanding of humanity as a cancer that must be removed for the earth to live. Now, the duty was to reduce carbon footprints, and reduce the population, in the name of saving the planet. Wrapped in this new vocabulary, and coming with a trendy, pervasive, and well-funded advertising campaign, the end result sounded remarkably similar to the eugenics of old. A new study from Lund University in Sweden says the single best way to cut your carbon footprint, assuming you want to, is simply to refuse to reproduce. Deleting some humans from existence, they say, saves far more carbon than, I don't know, being vegetarian, riding a bike to work, not boarding an airplane. There is a study that says, well, actually, if we reduce global fertility by half a child per woman, 
okay. that you could maybe do that. It would go a long way, but it would wow. reduce like a big chunk, a quarter to a, a fifth to a quarter of all carbon emissions needed to avoid that tipping point. So should we have policies that penalize people for having extra kids in the developed world? Um, so I do think that we should at least consider it. Well, at least consider it is like, do it. In the push to reduce global warming, children, according to some, are the new culprits. A think tank in the UK says too many kids are what's making the planet worse, saying large families, anything over two children really, should be frowned upon as an environmental no-no. And without the public even noticing it, the oligarchs were able to wrap themselves in this new flag to appear not as the billionaire scions of the oil industry who made their vast fortunes by plundering the earth and monopolizing its wealth, but as crusading environmentalists who are going to save the planet from the cannon fodder that unfortunately populates the earth. The negative impact of population growth on all of our planetary ecosystems is becoming appallingly evident. So we have been members of the IPCC, we have authored many of their papers, we have peer-reviewed all their papers. So we have, we have been engaged in the understanding of the, and the evolution of our understanding of climate change for decades. At Saudi Aramco, we strive to continually reduce the environmental impact of our operations, from oil well to consumer, and our support for the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative that strives to be a catalyst for practical action on climate change through collaboration on technology and best practices. We have a common reason. We care about uh, environment. We think that together we can do better. We have the competencies, we have the strength, we have the tools to do good things in this field. Technology that will be developed through this investment fund of $1 billion will uh, help us in, in the long term to reduce emissions. We want to build an ecosystem of innovation on this issue, working together. Putting our force together, we can bring pragmatic and concrete solutions. And even today, the masses, outraged over the carnage that big oil has wrought, are content to have that outrage directed by the very oligarchs they seek to oppose. The same oligarchs who are quietly funding and supporting their environmental movement from behind the scenes, and even leading it from the front. The Rockefeller family made headlines by divesting from oil completely in 2016. The Rockefellers, heir to an oil fortune that made the family name a symbol of American wealth, believe they're doing their namesake proud by getting out of oil. Fund director Stephen Hines spoke reverently of oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller in a statement. We are quite convinced that if he were alive today as an astute businessman looking out to the future, he would be moving out of fossil fuels and investing in clean, renewable energy. David Rothschild is one of the photogenic leading lights of the environmental movement dubbed Plastic Jesus for his publicity stunts and photo opportunities masquerading as a concerned environmentalist, David Rothschild, a scion of the billionaire banking family that added to its fortune with its Azerbaijani oil field holdings and still invests in oil through ventures like Genie Energy, now spends his time lecturing the public about how their lifestyles are killing the polar bears. We have to start spending money, um, you know, fast on the solutions that we have in hand to try and help these countries which are already seeing the effects of climate change today and seeing the effects of our, our consumption, basically. Prince Charles is outspoken on the subject of global warming, warning his loyal subjects that unless they tighten their belts and live more humble lives, they will bring about the end of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the battle against climate change is surely the most defining and pivotal challenge of our times. We cannot ignore the symptoms and should act now to restore the health of the planet before it is too late. This, of course, will require an unprecedented transformation of our communities, science, societies and lifestyles, all predicated on the move to a low carbon and circular economy. The groundwork has been laid for what these oligarchs call the post-carbon era, it is no longer about oil. It never was. It is about control. Now, 
to this complete cycle for the world, to give you a time scale on that, uh, bear in mind that started in 1857. And so here's where we were about three or four years ago. This was proved reserves in the air, which would add up to about here. And uh, the estimated peak would occur about 1995, and we go into the decline. The 10 per that middle 80 percent again is yeah. spread from the uh, 60s, the late 60s, up to a uh, little over 20, beyond 2020. Are computed out here about 56 years. Mm -hmm. That assumes an orderly evolution. <clears throat> that says that uh, a child born, say, within the last 10 years, will probably see the world consume most of its oil if he lives a normal life. In right? his lifetime. Today, Marion King Hubbard is best known as the shell oil researcher who gained notoriety in the 1950s for predicting that the U.S. would achieve its peak production of petroleum by 1970 and that almost all of the planet's oil supplies would be exhausted by 2020. This peak oil theory, still sometimes referred to as Hubbard's Peak, was, like everything else generated by big oil, a conveniently crafted lie, designed to habituate the market to artificial scarcity and thus keep oil prices high. Hubbard's prediction was not based on any empirical data from any oil field, but instead relied on Hubbard's incorrect guesses about remaining oil reserves and employed a heuristic tool to model production. As Hubbard's protege and colleague at Shell Oil, Kenneth DeFaze, conceded years later, the numerical methods that Hubbard used to make his prediction are not crystal clear. Today, 44 years later, my guess is that Hubbard, like everyone else, reached his conclusion first and then searched for raw data and methods to support his conclusion. Shortly before his death in 1989, Hubbard himself admitted that when he showed his peak oil paper to Shell's managing director before presenting it to his colleagues, the director had told him not to go overboard with his estimates of oil reserves, pointing specifically to L.G. Weeks, a rival geophysicist who had estimated reserves to be much higher, and thus the impending threat of undersupply and the need for high oil prices to be much weaker. But although today Hubbard is remembered almost exclusively for his peak oil thesis, he was in fact involved in a much larger, lifelong project, helping to codify and incorporate a movement that, much like eugenics, was wildly popular nearly a century ago, fell out of favor in polite society, and yet continues today under other names. That movement was called technocracy. Hello, I'm Arvid Peterson, and this is the first of a two-part presentation on technocracy, an alternative social system. These programs are not intended to entertain or amuse you, nor are they meant to scare you. We are making a new approach. It is not political, financial, philosophical, legal, religious, or moral. It is a technological approach. Technocracy is the scientific answer to America's social problems. And technocracy is a new design for social operation that is based upon science. It is the vehicle by which we can move into a new era for better living. Technocracy built itself as a social movement, a philosophy, a scientific solution to political and economic problems, and a new way of ordering the world. But at base, it is an idea for a new international economic order, one to be designed and managed down to the most minute detail by a select few, the technocrats. Technocracy was defined uh, very succinctly in 1938 by their own publication, the Technocrat Magazine. And they call it a system of scientific engineering of you know society. Uh, they saw themselves as a merger between um, hard science, and social science, which really is an oxymoron. Social science is not really a science, in my opinion. But uh, they really believed that. So they believed that they could take their scientific method that they used in the hard sciences and apply it to society. They also believed that they were that they they alone were the only ones that uh, could run society correctly, as a result of technology having come in and changed the fabric of society. They hated politicians. They hated the, the establishment, the organization of society the way it was because it was not efficient. It was not, um, uh, you know, conservation-based, if you will, to conserve resources. 
And so they just kind of took it upon themselves to uh, uh, define an economic model that would replace capitalism and free enterprise. And that's exactly what it was, replacement economic system. Drawing on Henry Saint-Simon's call for a scientifically organized socialist system, the positivism and secular humanism of Auguste Comte, and the principles of scientific management propounded by Frederick Taylor, the technocratic movement emerged from the same environment of progressivism, positivism, and social Darwinism that birthed eugenics. Just as the eugenicists believed the human race could be improved through selective breeding controlled and administered by a small group of scientists and their billionaire backers, so too did the technocrats believe that they could improve the social and economic conditions of humanity by controlling and administering society. And, happily enough for the oligarchs, the technocrats would improve the world by replacing money with energy certificates. Led by the eccentric revolutionary economist and sociologist Thorstein Veblen, the technocratic movement that formed around Veblen's new school for social research and technical alliance attracted both engineers and serious researchers like King Hubbard and Buckminster Fuller, and fellow eccentrics like Howard Scott. Scott, a mysterious man of uncertain background, established himself in New York City at the end of World War I and came to be seen as a bohemian engineer. In 1920, he went to work for the Wobblies as a research director, and the following year he founded the Technical Alliance, a group of engineers and scientists centered around Columbia University who, as a forerunner to the technocracy movement, advocated for a society run by scientists and engineers. In 1932, the charismatic and well-spoken Scott managed to attach himself to Walter Raudenstrauk, a professor at Columbia and the founder of the university's Department of Industrial Engineering. With a common interest in technocracy, the two became friends and allies. It was through Raudenstrauk that Scott was able to approach the president of Columbia, Nicholas Murray Butler, for permission to use the university's facilities. Butler, always on the lookout for the cutting edge of progressivism, was swayed by the technocratic ideas, and soon Scott's Committee on Technocracy was operating out of the basement of Hamilton Hall. When Butler let word slip about the next big idea being cooked up in the basement of his university, technocracy became a sensation. It was lauded in the press, Scott became a sought-after speaker, and there was even a dance named after the movement. It was at Columbia that Scott met King Hubbard, and the two, an unlikely pair of serious-minded researcher and eccentric revolutionary, immediately hit it off. Their stint together at Columbia was about to come to an abrupt end, but their association would last for decades and help give birth to ideas that would eventually transform the world. Technocracy really got uh, recognized when it was at Columbia. Uh, we'll talk in a minute. They didn't last there very long because, as it turned out, one of the promoters of technocracy, Howard Scott, uh, turned out to be a fraud. He was kind of the main spokesman for the movement, and uh, he pumped up his resume, like so many people do today, unfortunately. He pumped it up and basically just lied about his, his past, his educational past. And they all assumed he had a degree in some advanced engineering, whatever, and he knew all the buzzwords. But uh, some sharp reporter did some investigative research on him and said, I can't find where this guy graduated anywhere. And when Columbia found out that the guy was a fraud, they, they realized they'd been that, well, Butler's ego got involved and says, man, these, these people have played me. And so he kicked them all out, just kaboom, drop kicked them right out. of. He said, get out of my building. And they all left and scattered. And uh, the, uh, the technocrats that were left at Columbia, which where there were several of them that were professors at Columbia at the time, uh, they just zipped their lips, shut up, went back to work, figured out, I want to keep my job. I'm just going to, you know, not ever mention technocracy again. It didn't mean they stopped believing, but uh, they didn't talk about it for a very, very long time at Columbia. Disgraced, evicted from Columbia, and with the Committee on Technocracy disbanded almost as quickly as it had come together, Scott found himself at a personal low. Penniless and with an old debt having caught up to him, he had only one person he could rely on. M. King Hubbard. Hubbard let Scott live in his Greenwich Village apartment and paid out of his own pocket to file the Articles of Incorporation for Technocracy, Inc., 
a new membership organization that would carry on the principles of technocracy. The first step, of course, was to define precisely what those principles were. Hubbard got to work penning the Technocracy Study Course, the Bible of the technocracy movement. In it, Hubbard laid out the vision of an abundance of physical wealth on a continental scale for the use of all continental citizens, which, he warned, can only be accomplished by a continental technological control, a governance of function, a technate. The technocratic system was to be structured around a new monetary paradigm, one based not on dollars and cents, but energy certificates representing the nation's net energy expenditure. These certificates would be denominated in jewels and issued based on a net energy budget deemed appropriate by the technocratic state's governing scientists. Citizens would be issued an equal share of the nation's certificates and make their purchases with them, and the information about these purchases would be relayed back to the central planning body for analysis. By this method, the technocrats could, in the words of one proponent, create a thermodynamically balanced load of production and consumption, thereby doing away with unemployment, debt, and social injustice. In the technocracy study course, Hubbard, like a good technocrat, laid out the exact conditions that would need to be met for this vision to come to pass. According to him, technocracy would require all energy usage and all consumer spending throughout the nation to be calculated and registered on a continuous and instantaneous basis, a 24-7 inventory of all production and consumption, a complete registry of all products available for sale, where they were produced, how much energy was expended in their production, and where and when they were sold. And finally, a specific registration of the consumption of each individual, plus a record and description of the individual. Hubbard's vision was not just that of a totalitarian society, in which every detail of every interaction was recorded and reported to a central authority, but, for the 1930s, the concept of continuously and instantaneously updated registries of every good in the economy was not just audacious, but borderline insane. Nevertheless, suffering through the Great Depression, the American people were willing to listen to any ideas to replace the current system that had so obviously failed them, no matter how outlandish. Technocracy Inc. did attract a following, swelling into the tens of thousands later in the decade. But Scott's eccentric ways, compelling members to salute him in public and delivering rambling radio addresses, ultimately led to the movement's long, slow decline in relevance. Hubbard never repudiated the concept of technocracy, but when he joined Shell as a researcher, he resigned his position on the board of Technocracy Inc. and avoided direct mention of the organization. The technocrats had sketched the outlines of a completely ordered and controlled society, one in which energy is the fundamental measure of value and all consumption and production is meticulously analyzed by a central authority. Technocracy Inc. still exists to this day, but the language and thinking of the technocrats has, like eugenics, undergone a metamorphosis. And, also like eugenics, the name may have faded into obscurity, but the idea lives on in the hands of the oligarchs. Would you live in a greener lifestyle if you could make money from it? Mm, that may be possible if a government proposal for personal carbon emissions allowances is implemented under the scheme, everyone in the UK would be allocated an annual carbon allowance. Stored electronically, rather like a supermarket loyalty card, points would be deducted every time we buy or use non-renewable energy. For example, using electricity to power appliances in the home. Or travelling somewhere by plane. Or even buying petrol for your car on the forecourt. Now, any points left over could then be sold back to a central bank. Are you still with us? And people who need more, like motorists who had used their allocations, could then pay for a top-up. Carbon rationing, carbon trading, carbon taxes, cap and trade. Just as the technocrats of old envisioned a new economic order based on energy and governed by the dictates of scientists and engineers, so too does this modern form of technocracy envision an economic order in which energy is budgeted, priced, and traded by intergovernmental panels of scientists and the political caste that grows up around these institutions. The Environmental Protection Agency is not a frivolous agency. It is created to 
yes, to regulate um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, I have been saying to the West Virginia Coal Association, which for the most part doesn't believe in climate science, they don't believe there's a climate problem. And I have been saying to them for a number of years that that's wrong in my judgment. There is a, the science is true. The science is unequivocally true. And that, that there is a price to carbon in their future. I said this a couple of months ago. Uh, there's a price to carbon in their future. But I believe that the cap and trade approach is the essential first step, partly because it is the only basis upon which we can envision a truly global agreement, because it's very difficult to imagine a harmonized global tax. A carbon tax, or any other way of putting a carbon price, um, is actually, from an economic point of view, the most effective and efficient way to do this, okay? You can regulate and you can do, you know, all kinds of things, but the nothing is as strong a market signal to the private sector as a carbon price, whether that be a carbon tax or whether it be a cap and trade, which is what California is doing, or any of the other measures that ultimately give you a carbon price. But that is the simplest, cleanest, most powerful, um, most powerful signal. So if that's possible, I'm with you. These measures are sold to the public as a way of penalizing the big oil interests that have spent the last century monopolizing the world's key resources and plundering the earth in the pursuit of profit. What they do not understand, because it has been deliberately obscured, is that it is these very interests that have been instrumental in creating these schemes in the first place. It's my understanding that back in 1997, when you were vice president, Enron's CEO, Ken Lay, was involved in discussions with you at the White House about helping develop this type of policy, this trading scheme. And uh, is, that, is that accurate? Is it inaccurate? It's, it's been reported. Uh, I, I, I don't know. But, but I, I met with uh, uh, Ken Lay, as lots of people did, before anybody knew, knew uh, that he was a right. crook. And, and clearly, it, you can see why so many of us are concerned about this type of cap-and-trade energy uh, tax that would be literally turning over this country's I energy economy. I didn't know him economy. well enough to call him Kenny Boy. Well, you, but you knew him well enough to help devise this trading scheme. In the early 1990s, Enron, the disgraced Texas-based energy trading company that turned out to be a complete fraud, spearheaded the EPA's $20 billion cap-and-trade program for sulfur dioxide, promptly becoming the largest trader in that market. As a follow-up, the company, led by Ken Lay, began lobbying the Clinton administration, and particularly Vice President Al Gore, to create a similar market for carbon dioxide, making lavish contributions to environmental groups like the Nature Conservancy, whose climate change project argued for restrictions on carbon emissions. Enron then hired Christopher Horner, a former staffer on Senator Joe Lieberman's Environment Committee, to lobby for an international treaty that would restrict emissions and allow for trading in emission rights. They were joined in this quest by Goldman Sachs, the infamous Wall Street investment bank known today for the revolving door between the firm and the U.S. Treasury, who helped establish the Chicago Climate Exchange as the first North American emissions trading platform. In 2004, Al Gore, who has spent the last two decades lobbying for the creation of a carbon trading market, founded Generation Investment Management, an investment management partnership that sells carbon offsets, with David Blood, the CEO of Goldman Sachs Asset Management, who stepped down from his position with Goldman to go into business with Gore. By the end of the decade, Gore was already being hailed as a candidate to become the world's first carbon billionaire. Gore himself is an oligarch. His father, Al Gore Sr., was a close friend of Armand Hammer, the oil tycoon behind Occidental Petroleum. After losing a Senate race in 1970, Gore's father went to work for Hammer at Occidental for $500,000 a year. Over the course of his career, Gore Sr. accumulated hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of Occidental stock, which fell into the hands of the executor of his estate at the time of his death, none other than his son, Al Gore. The Occidental connection does not end there. Discovering zinc ore on their Tennessee estate, 
Hammer bought the Gore's land and sold it back to them with a claim on the mining rights, complete with a $20,000 annual payment, which also went to Gore after his father's death. In 2013, Gore earned $100 million from the Qatari government on the sale of his current TV venture, and then was surprised when reporters were more interested in discussing his oil money than his new book on the global warming cause. But Gore's story is only an example of a larger phenomenon. In 2006, the United States Climate Action Partnership was formed to create a call for action to cut down on carbon emissions. It drafted the Blueprint for Legislative Action, which became the basis for the American Clean Energy and Security Act, seeking to create an emissions trading regime modeled on the European Union Emission Trading Scheme. And the members of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership? A who's who of the oligarchy, including BP, ConocoPhillips, and General Motors. Carbon taxes and carbon trading have proven to be a hard sell for an increasingly wary public, but with the Paris Agreement of 2015, the world saw the biggest step yet towards this technocratic future of energy control and carbon rationing. No surprise, then, that the summit itself was sponsored by, and prominently supported by, Big Oil. What's your position, and what message would you send to the President? Well, we have been clear uh, in our support of the climate, the climate Agreement in Paris. We were part of uh, the oil and glass climate initiative, which is 10 of the big companies in the world who are working towards projects and technologies that are needed. Um, I think we all want to know how the formula will work, but I think, um, I think the concept of Paris uh, needs to stay in everybody's mind on, the, on the, uh, the issues of we've got to transition the world to a lower carbon forms of energy. I have no doubt it will happen. Yes, I think that uh, what, what happened in Paris is very, very important. And um, uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon underlined that yesterday, that is important not only for the planet, not only for us citizens, not only for our children. It is important for the business. But using energy as the new metric of value for the post-carbon economy is just one element of the neo-technocratic vision. When Hubbard wrote his technocracy study course, he made it clear that technocracy could not come to fruition without 24-7 surveillance of all energy usage and a continuous stream of data about all goods being produced by and consumed by society. But whereas in the 1930s such a system must have seemed like a delusional flight of fancy, today it is already being implemented. By now, you may have heard the term Internet of Things, Sounds interesting, but what does the Internet of Things actually mean? IoT is an evolution of mobile, home, and embedded applications that are being connected to the Internet, integrating greater compute capabilities, and using data analytics to extract meaningful information. Billions of devices will be connected to the Internet, and soon, hundreds of billions of devices. As related devices connect with each other, they can become an intelligent system of systems. And when these intelligent devices and systems of systems share data over the cloud and analyze it, they can transform our businesses, our lives, and our world in countless ways. Why create a smart city? Well, smart cities are more responsive to citizens and they help reduce environmental impact. They're more cost effective and they're safer. Smart cities make people happier and more connected to their community. Cities are becoming increasingly instrumented. Sensors that enable the capture of all sorts of data are being integrated across city systems, providing critical information on city activity and operations. Sensors on a bridge transmit data on its physical condition. A camera on a freeway relays traffic flow. And digital meters record water and energy usage in real time. Mobile and social channels enable local governments and citizens to communicate with each other, creating yet another source of useful data. Advanced analytics can now readily identify trends and patterns within these massive amounts of data. Information can be integrated, gathered and shared via dashboards, visualizations, and alerts to facilitate understanding and collaboration across systems, agencies, and groups. This department store in Bundang has introduced a new way to shop. With its smart shopper system, customers pick up a small scanner and tag the item they want to buy. It eliminates the hassle of having to carry heavy items in a shopping basket, not to mention the hassle of having to get them home. 
after you pay for the items at an automated kiosk, the goods are delivered right to your home. Before, I had to wait in long lines at the checkout, but now I can use a smart shopper system to pay. It's really quite convenient. Aside from their convenience to shoppers, the system also helps stores gather data about their customers' shopping habits. The smart home communicates with the grid and enables consumers to manage their electricity usage. By measuring a home's electricity consumption more frequently through a smart meter, utilities can provide their customer with much better information to manage their electricity bills. Inside the smart home, a home area network, or HAN, connects smart appliances, thermostats, and other electric devices to an energy management system. With the, the smart meters, they'll be able to tell exactly what's going on in your home at any, down to the microsecond, um, based upon 24-7 uh, communication with all of your appliances, which will also in the future, if this goes through fully and if, if there's not a public backlash, um, all of your appliances will need to have a wireless transmitter on them and they'll need to be you know, certified under some smart you know, program. So this means that not only, uh, just stepping aside from one, mo one moment to the health issue, this means that not only is your smart meter emitting on average of 13,000 microwave pulses per day, but every one of your appliances is going to be doing the same thing because it will be need needed to be communicating with the smart meter itself. So that is a serious concern. We'll get into that a little bit later. But as far as the privacy issue, um, just diving right in. The current CIA director, David Petraeus, was quoted as saying, we're going to use uh, smart appliances to spy on you. And, and it's almost like, and he was later on down in the article, and it's very just putting it out there. It's kind of like it's getting to a point now, James, I'm sure you're seeing this, is like there, it's just getting more and more in your face. And it's kind of like this, this collective force uh, of the controllers, and they're kind of saying, this is what we're going to do, and what are you going to do about it? So they're almost challenging us in a, in a sort of, you know, schoolhouse bully sort of way. What are you going to do about it? Once again, we are being asked to believe that the vested corporate interests that are rolling these technologies out in a coordinated fashion are doing so for the benefit of the public. That this technology is to help save the Earth. And once again, we are being duped. The technocratic agenda is not about saving the Earth. It is not about helping the public. It is not even about making money. It is about complete control over every aspect of our daily life. So there's two levels, and the way I look at technocracy, there's two levels operating at the same time. There's the, the operational side of it that has to do with things like smart grid, that have to do with things like uh, you know various technocratic innovations. Surveillance is another big hot button for technocracy. These are operational issues. From a strategic point of view, which is where the Rockefeller type people operate, it's, it's a different view of where it's headed. On an operational level, it's headed towards scientific dictatorship. And it doesn't, you don't have to be a visionary to figure that one out. You really, anymore, you don't, it's there. But on a strategic basis, What's happening is that there's a massive resource grab going on all over the planet. And when I say resource grab, <clears throat> you have to put yourself in Rockefeller's shoes and the banker's shoes, the Rothschild shoes and whatever, and say, what do you do when money wears out? What do you do? When you sucked all the value you can out of the monetary systems you created, what's left? <laughs> well, it's... You and I don't think about those sort of things because we don't have that much money. But these people at the top, the, especially the bankers, they, they, I'm sure they stay up at night thinking, what's, what's after money? What comes after money? The Rockefeller family, especially, has always been a resource-intensive family. That's what oil was all about in the first place. It was a resource. And they understood that energy would be the most important factor in the world over any other type of resource. They understood that. That's why they wanted to create a monopoly over energy. <clears throat> well, today, as money has been sucked dry, 
The only thing left to do is to make a grab for the resources themselves. And that's what sustainable development is all about. Is taking the resources of the world away from you and me. Away from private companies that aren't part of the clique, if you will. And putting them into a global common trust that will be managed by them for their benefit. This is really nothing more than neo-feudalism, again, where the resources are owned by a few and everybody else gets to operate with those resources at their pleasure and discretion. The technocrats and the functionaries of this agenda, like Hubbard and his colleagues in Technocracy Inc., pioneered this idea because they believed that they, the technocrats and engineers, would be able to solve the world's problems. But the oligarchs and bankers who funded their ideas into existence did so because it would help them to become the rulers of a system so perfectly crafted that no resource, no commodity, no person would be beyond their control. And now, in the 21st century, that technocratic vision is coming into view. And it is being helped along by a public that believes the post-carbon future represents the end of the oligarchy. They couldn't be more wrong. Oil. It was never about oil. It was about control. Control over energy and production and consumption. Control over the world's resources. Control over the population. Control over humanity itself. Every other thing that the elite put forward is nothing more than a pretext for what they've been after since the beginning. So as I cover in Tragedy and Hope 101, I discuss this concept of the elite seeking to rule all habitable portions of the world. And they don't want to secure that so that they can then have it taken away from them. So they come up with pretexts that they can sell both to the public, but also to the administrative uh, class that justifies what it is that they're trying to do. They need to. So whether it's global warming hysteria, or whether it's technocracy, or whether it's uh, Agenda 2030, or whether it's eugenics, there's a common thread that runs through all of this. And that common thread is the desire to consolidate and exercise coercive power. In the uh, case of eugenics, it's the desire to consolidate and exercise the ultimate power, which is the power over who ultimately is going to live or die, who will be permitted to exist in the gene pool from here forward. The picture is bleak, and made all that much bleaker by the fact that so many have been duped into believing that the oligarch's ultimate agenda, an agenda of technocratic control, micromanagement of our daily lives, and, ultimately, the elimination of the cannon fodder from the gene pool, is in fact in their own best interest. The oligarchs, shielded behind their smokescreen of sustainable development and post-carbon economy, are closer than ever before to achieving their true goal of total control. But if the people perish from lack of knowledge of this agenda, then understanding is the first step toward the solution. It's hard to fight an enemy that you don't recognize or can't see. That's the biggest problem in the world today, in my opinion, is that people have no visibility whatsoever of this issue. They've covered their tracks so well that nobody can see them. How can you fight an enemy that you don't know? I think, I think the famous Chinese general Sun Tzu brought that up hundreds of years ago. You can't fight an enemy that you don't know. 
first we have to recognize who the enemy is. Well, big oil conquered the world because monopolization of all resources on the planet is the goal. And to get to that goal, you have to monopolize the energy aspects uh, of, of, of people uh, around the planet. But you also have to control the food, the, the, the actual energy for the human beings whose energy you want to control. If you control those two aspects, the green revolution and the gene revolution, then you're able to control the entire planet, every resource on it, um, and basically extinguish freedom uh, for the rest of history. So how big oil conquered the world was already done in the movie. Why big oil conquered the world has to do with the complexities of controlling populations, not for money, because these are the people that print money out of nothing and charge us for it. So really, it's a study of power. So why did they want to do this to the rest of us? Because they could and because we were tolerant so far and haven't resisted enough to, to make it stop. So that's where we find ourselves today, becoming informed on the history so that we can actually plot our, our course in the future to, to, to map or chart out a course and actually get to some place that resembles cognitive liberty and physical freedom and justice for all. Big oil, big pharma, genetic engineering, the green revolution, the environmental movement, eugenics, technocracy. Not one person in a thousand can detail the historical development of these ideas or the people and the agenda that connects them. But if you have watched this documentary, you are now that one person in a thousand. The question is, what are you going to do with this information? As the oligarch's quest for total control comes into view, it's difficult to remember that it all started a century and a half ago with Devil Bill Rockefeller, a two-bit snake oil salesman always on the run from the last group of marks he managed to con. In a way, nothing has changed but the scope of the con and the number of marks who have fallen for the routine. But now that you know the snake oil that is being fed to the public, the only question that matters is, are you going to drink it? Down in Pennsylvania, there is plenty oil, they say, petroleum, petroleum, we must all have some. The oily fever, don't you see, infects most every live Yankee from north, from east and west. They come for petroleum oil, 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 oh, petroleum. Hello, this is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, the writer, director, narrator, and creator of the documentary you've just been watching, Why Big Oil Conquered the World. And if you have just watched this documentary all the way through, as well as the previous documentary on how big oil conquered the world, then as I say towards the end, you really are now better informed than the vast majority of the public on these issues and on the history of this picture that I'm trying to paint here. And the real question is, what are you... What are we going to do with this information? Well, the first thing I'd like to encourage you to do is to go to corporatereport.com slash big oil. That is the, the destination where you will be able to find audio and video copies of the entire documentary, How Big Oil and Why Big Oil Conquered the World, uh, all there for your free download and perusal and as a handy link that you can share with others if, if and when you're ready to start sharing this information. But perhaps the most important part of corporatereport.com slash big oil is the hyperlinked transcript. Everything that is said in this documentary, including sources to all the source documents from which this information came, is in that transcript. It is a very important tool for people to use when you are ready to start delving into this information in greater detail, because as much ground as I was able to cover in the three hours of this combined documentary, there's still so much more that needs to be said and so much more information that helps to color in this image that I've only sketched the broad outlines of here. And the transcript, along with the hyperlinks to source documentation, is a good way to start filling in the different pieces of this puzzle. Uh, but it doesn't end there. And I'm not going to end the story there because there are 
it, I could have easily made several documentaries instead of just this one and trying to condense it all into one. There's so much more that needs to be said, and certain things that only appear in the documentary for one or two minutes can and should be developed into entire hour-long uh, explorations. So that's exactly what I'm going to be doing in the coming weeks and months. I'm going to be further developing some of the ideas that are introduced here and some of the characters and history and fleshing them out in podcast episodes on CorbettReport.com where we'll explore these issues in much greater detail. So please stay tuned for that. And as I say, once you've started getting into this research and looking at some of the source documents and you are uh, familiar with this material and you want to share it with others, then CorbettReport.com slash Big Oil is the place to go and the place to send people to uh, for that exploration. Uh, other ways that you can help with this work, rather than simply spreading the information, which is the first and foremost and most important thing, but also I will be doing interviews uh, on this subject and on this documentary. So if you have a favorite radio program or podcast or whatever it is that you listen to or enjoy and you'd like to hear me on there being interviewed about this, please do send your suggestions into those various hosts to have me on and uh, that would be appreciated. The other thing you can do is to get physical hard copies of this uh, because there are people out there who don't trust anything they see on the internet but if it's on a physical disc, they'll, they'll be more receptive to it. Well, that's fine. And other people just want a physical hard copy of it. Well, you can purchase a physical hard copy of the documentary, both How Big Oil Conquered the World and Why Big Oil Conquered the World. They're available in a two DVD set that is now available from CorbettReport.com uh, for $20 US. That includes shipping and handling anywhere in the world. It's two discs. It's the three hour uh, documentary in complete, uh, complete form here. So uh, that is a valuable resource as well. And I, as always, highly encourage you to make copies of this and hand it out to everyone and anyone, friends and neighbors and coworkers and total strangers and anyone else who you think might be receptive to this information because this is a huge, huge topic and not, no one of us has all the pieces to this puzzle. It is only through all of us coming at this material from our different perspectives and experiences with our different uh, knowledge bases that we'll be able to really construct the big picture of what's happening here. So as I say, lots more coming on this material in the coming weeks and months to help flesh this out at CorbettReport.com. But in the meantime, please do go to CorbettReport.com slash Big Oil for all of the information regarding this documentary. I think it's uh, the most important information that we can be talking about right now. And I hope that you'll uh, join me in that conversation at CorbettReport.com slash Big Oil. Thank you.